Thanks. Th thanks a lot, Leo. First of all, thanks a lot to Manuel, Pablo, Santiago, and Leo for organizing the session. And also thanks a lot for the invitation to speak here. It's really a, a great pleasure. As others expressed, I would have also loved to be in Buenos Aires for this event, and meet everybody in person and so on, but uh, I hope that uh, there will be another opportunity uh, later. Okay, so my plan is to talk to you a little bit about this work that is the Parabolic Anderson Model on Agalton Watson Tree, which is joint with uh, Frank Den Hollander and Wolfgang uh, Koenig. So I'll have to explain to you exactly what my model is. And this work appeared also in the same volume that uh, Alejandro mentioned to us um, in honor of Ladas, organized by uh, Mario Lalia, Luciana Fontes, and Chuck Newman. Uh, okay, so here's uh, my, short, my short plan for, th for the talk. First of all, I'm going to just tell you what my model is. So this parabolic Anderson model on a graph. Uh, then I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over some literature, some previous results, uh, especially on ZD, because ZD is the most studied graph in this model. And my hope here is to motivate a little bit to you why, why we are interested in the things that we obtain, the result that we obtain, and also maybe what's the outlook, what maybe could be natural follow-up uh, questions and, and so on in view of, of uh, what is known in other cases. And if I have a bit of time, then I'll give you some uh, proof ideas of, 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 the, of the proof. All right, so what is the palm on, on a graph? So, okay, so I start with a graph, which for me will be a simple undirected graph, okay? That can be finite or uh, countable. So let's say ZD is a, is a good example, but could be a finite subset, uh, or maybe could be a complete graph or something like this, okay? And of course, uh, I'm going to assume that I have finite degrees. So I'm going to say, let's call the degree of a point X on my vertex set it's just the number of uh, neighbors, right? Just the number of um, uh, points that are neighboring my, uh, my point X. And oops, I'm very sorry. It happens to me every now and again with this application. Uh, let's see, okay, sorry, starting over. Uh, so that's the set of neighbors. And I'm assuming that this is a finite number for each for each X. Um, and okay, so uh, what's important for me here to, the, to be able to define this model is to have a definition of a Laplacian. So here I have the definition of the graph Laplacian. Uh, in this case, I have something undirected and simple. So I can define if I have a function on my vertex set I can define the Laplacian as the sum over neighbors. Uh, I should also introduce this. Well, this is very common. I guess that uh, everybody knows this notation. So I'm, I'm saying that um, uh, maybe I can put it here on the corner that I say that Y is a neighbor of X if this is of course an edge in my graph. No? Uh, so I define my Laplacian and uh, it's also good for me to have um, the graph distance. So I'm going to call the distance, this is the graph distance between uh, the two points. Okay, so that's the, the most important ingredient here. Um, well, there's a second important ingredient, but which is not really dependent on the graph, which is a uh, random potential. So now that I have a graph, I have a Laplacian on the graph, I add a random potential, which for me is going to be a collection of IID random variables. I call them Xi, Xi X, IID, uh, which I'm going to use to define my model. My model is going to be, uh, the definition is going to be the solution to a certain uh, PDE, linear PDE uh, with random coefficients. And I need an initial con condition for the PDE. I call it U0, non-negative. So that's 
my model is basically this, this function u, which is the solution to a Cauchy problem like this. I start it at time zero as my function u. And then I evolve it according to this equation. The time derivative is going to be the Laplacian plus this multiplicative uh, potential. And this is what is usually, uh, this is what we mean when we say the parabolic Anderson model, usually we, we mean the non-negative solution to this uh, Cauchy problem. Uh, okay, so in this generality that I uh, just said, of course, maybe we don't know that there is a solution. Maybe we don't know that the solution is unique if it is non-negative and so on, but under some mild conditions, here, maybe on the graph, if it's infinite, and also on the on the on the tail of the potential, the the upper tail and the lower tail, we can make sense of this and say, okay, there is one unique, non-negative uh, solution for this. This is going to be the case for for my model. Okay, so every case that I'm going to consider. Ah, yeah, of course, this is for time positive and any point. Ah, uh, very well. So this is. This is my model. Né? Uh, why is it called parabolic? Well, it's very clear because this is a parabolic equation. Why is it called the Anderson model? Why is there the name Anderson there? Because this um, operator that appears here on the right-hand side, the Laplacian plus Xi, this is known as the Anderson operator in solid states, uh, solid state physics. So for example, you could consider here Instead of the parabolic problem, you could consider the Schrodinger equation with uh, with this a potential like this, and this would be something well with a different type of, of interest, but it's the same the same operator. Very well. So half of my title is explained. Uh, but okay, why? What does it have? I mean, so far the only probabilistic thing here is this ram random potential, so random coefficients of my of my equation. But there are other interesting probabilistic things coming up. And in particular, uh, we can have a, in the cases where, usually in the cases where it makes sense to talk about the solution, we have a very nice probabilistic interpretation of the solution, which is given by the so-called Feynman-Katz uh, representation, okay? So I'm going to specialize to the case where my initial condition is just a unit mass on some fixed, point in my vertex set, so uh, the origin of, of my graph. My graph. I root my graph on some root, some, some vertex here, some fixed vertex. I start the, the evolution from an unit mass there. And uh, in the setting, I can write down what is my solution in terms of an expectation. And there is this exponential term here that I'm going to explain. And there is a random process that I'm calling X. And this is just a um, continuous time, simple random walk on my graph. Okay, X, T is continuous time. Uh, simple random walk on the graph. Okay, and of course this expectation here is just with respect to the random walk because the potential is fixed. This is a random variable depending on the potential and started from this particular, this particular set here. So uh, often when I'm talking about this model, I delay a lot the introduction of this representation, but I, I feel like uh, since this is a session about random walks, it's good that I justify why I'm talking about this subject on this, on this session. So there, there are random walks here. Uh, and yes, and this representation is of course extremely useful to, to study properties of um, the solution, which is in principle just the solution of something, of some equation, but you can uh, try to figure out uh, what could the random walk say, the behavior of the random walk here inside the Feynman-Katz formula tell you about uh, the solution. Uh, very well. Uh, yes, and uh, usually that's the situation when you want to show, for example, existence of the equation of the solution, you start by showing that this is well-defined, that, that this Feynman-Katz representation is indeed something 
meaningful, uh, 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 finite, and so on, and then uh, you go from there. Uh, very well. So let me talk a little bit about the um, literature and the main questions that people have considered and so on. And that's that's going to be basically all on ZD because that's the, the graph where people have really studied this model uh, the most. Uh, and well, here's the picture. So the as far as I understand, the, the, the biggest interest in studying this model and also one of the most important features of the model. Um, well, on one side, on, on the one hand, it's because it's a very simple model. It's the solution of a linear equation, which is random, okay, but it's linear. It's, it's a really, really simple model. There are very good tools to study it. But on the other hand, the phenomenology that it displays is interesting and appears in much more complicated uh, models in, in situations that are, that are quite interesting. So, it's a good, say, toy model to see these things coming up, as I understand. So uh, and the, the main feature is what people call intermittency, which, uh, so intermittency for me as a word, it's something not, for me, not 100% well-defined, but I think the idea is more or less this, that when you look, let's say, uh, look at the solution U of T in space for very large uh, times, and what you see is not a picture in a large scale, it's not a picture that is becoming homogeneous where the solution uh, is approaching something very smooth, quite the opposite. The solution is developing some really uh, prominent inhomogeneities. So the action on the solution, what's happening on the solution, the information is getting concentrated on these islands, the intermittent islands, which are uh, you know, okay, maybe in this picture is not the, the best to convince you. This, it's just a suggestion. In any case, the pictures are just because my pictures by hand are very bad. <laughs> so this is uh, just an illustration, okay? But the idea is that there should be these islands. These islands should be relatively well separated. And uh, the pot on a large scale, the potential looks very rough because everything is actually happening in these islands and they are very isolated and, and um, relatively small and so on. Uh, okay, but that's more or less the heuristic picture. Uh, let me try to um, nail this down a little bit, explain this a bit more. So in terms of uh, mass concentration, what would we, um, how could we understand say the phenomenon of, of intermittency or a manifestation of intermittency so it, as, as mass concentration. So let's call this capital U here of T. I'm just going to call it, oops, the total mass of the solution. So I sum over X, the solution. So that's the total mass at, at time T. And then uh, in that picture, what that picture was uh, suggesting, something like that, that you have some small islands, right? And maybe there, are some, there is some set, which I'm, I'm calling gamma of t here, a relatively small set. And around uh, each one of these points, there is also some kind of, there's some radius, right? I need another color. Um, there is some radius, which I'm calling alpha t. And the uh, statement of mass concentration will be, okay, there is some relatively small gamma t and also relatively small alpha t such that this is here basically, in some sense, uh, the same as when I sum all the points that are not far from this gamma set, say that are closer than alpha t to the gamma t set, and I just sum the mass of these sites. So this is a, a sense in which we could try to make sense of the effect of, of intermittency, okay? Uh, but that's not how the story started in, in the literature. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the literature. There is a very important paper by uh, Jürgen Gettner and, and Mochanov in the 90s, where they kind of introduced this model in a mathematically rigorous fashion, and they prove many things like uh, existence and uniqueness and so on. And they also prove that intermittency in some sense holds very generally and the sense 
in which they um, consider intermittency is in terms of moments of the total mass. So it's intermittency uh, in terms of, um, say, uh, norms, LP norms of the total mass, the growth of these, of these LP norms. And well, apparently this is an idea that comes from the physics literature. There is some heuristics that connects this to this kind of geometric picture, but that's the definition by their books. <clears throat> and they show that in this sense, the model is intermittent very generally. Uh, but this also motivates the study of the asymptotics of these mo moments by itself, right? So this was done in a series of papers under various uh, hypotheses on the potential, on the tails of the, of the potential. And I'm mentioning just a couple of them here. So there's a follow-up by both. Then there is a paper by Marek and Wolfgang Koenig in 2000, I think it's 2001. Uh, and then there's another important paper by Remco uh, van der Hofstadt, Wolfgang and Peter Mertes in 2006. They are doing uh, asymptotics or I should say log asymptotics of uh, both these moments and uh, almost sure asymptotics for the total mass itself, for the log of the total mass uh, itself. And okay, there's a lot more that they are doing as well. In this uh, last paper that I mentioned here, they are classifying universality classes according to the, to the asymptotic behavior of this. There's some classes of variational formulas that appear when you uh, expand. You, you, you try to obtain an asymptotic expansion uh, of this, which uh, split the behavior according to classes of the potential, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, another very interesting thing that comes out of these analyses uh, is that they, they are not proving this geometric picture, this picture of mass concentration directly, but the techniques that they are applying, they suggest the correct scales so, and there's a lot of information coming out of this analysis, even though there's not a formal proof of the mass concentration. And one thing that is identified, I think it's already identified uh, early, for example, here, the second paper of Gethin Mochanov, they are dealing with these potentials, which are in a critical case that is called the double exponential uh, tail case, okay? So double exponential tail is a kind of inverted um, Gumbel distribution, where you say the probability that my potential at zero uh, is bigger than u, this is equal to e to the minus e to the u, and then there is a parameter, which is usually uh, parameterized like this, with a row, um, with a row uh, here on the bottom, okay? So uh, the higher the, ho the row, the heavier the tail in some sense, okay? So the, the, the row is parameterizing for a small row, the, the tail is thinner, for larger row, the tail is um, heavy. But of course, this is still a very light tail, became doubly exponentially fast. And the picture is that, that picture that I drew to you before, heuristically, it should be the following. When the, your tails are lighter than double exponential, then these islands here, they are growing at a certain rate. So this alpha t is growing slowly to infinity. Uh, when, the, when the tails are heavier than double exponential, then this, this alpha is just zero. The islands, they collapse to points. They are just points. And exactly at the double exponential class, then something intermediate interesting is happening where these islands, they are not points but they're not growing really at any rate either. So they, are, they have some kind of non-trivial uh, structure. So this double exponential case is um, very much uh, studied in this literature because of this uh, very well. Um, so I'm not going to uh, describe this in, in, in a lot of detail, but uh, so there, there was a lot of, um, further results trying to make uh, uh, precise or rigorous this geometric description of the intermittency. And this is a paper where they, they did something like this. They obtain this gamma t and the gamma t 
is uh, grows slowly compared to t, so grows slower than any power of t. And you manage to show the mass concentration uh, for uh, any alpha t growing to infinity as low as you want that statement that if you sum the, um, uh, all the values of, the, of, of your function in a neighborhood, in a small neighborhood of these points of this sparse set, then you are capturing almost surely in this case, uh, the whole mass of the solution, the limit. Actually, the statement is, is there's a lot more that they do and the statement is a lot more precise, but I'm just uh, trying to give the idea. Uh, yeah, okay, this, this paper left a very interesting question, which is the following, okay. So you're telling me that the islands, they are small and the number of them is also not very big, but what is this number here exactly? Can you take a small, can you make this precise as asymptotics? How, how many islands do I need and so on? And uh, later there was a very dramatic answer to this in another case. So uh, in um, uh, a paper afterwards, uh, Remco, uh, Peter Mertes and Nadia Sidorova introduced the model uh, on uh, heavy tilt. potentials. So by, by heavy tilt here, I'm, I'm calling uh, something which does not have all exponential moments, okay, which are needed to study the moments of the total mass. So here they studied also asymptotics of the, of the total mass, almost sure in, in, in distribution, say distributional limits and almost sure limits. Um, and then in a paper on the next year, there's a paper by uh, also Wolfgang and now with Hubert Lacan and Peter Murtes and Nadia, where they show something very dramatic, which is, so I, I can, maybe I should write this down. So there exists a certain unique point, okay? A process that depends only on the potential. And if you compare the uh, solution at this point with the total mass, this is basically the same thing. This converges to one in probability as time goes on. Uh, actually, they do more. They do uh, what they call a, a two cities theorem. Because, okay, here, the statement is not almost sure and it's impossible to be that, that it is almost sure for some continuity properties here because we are, we are talking, we are uh, considering continuous time. But they also show that if you take two points, you can have an almost sure statement. So it's as good as you can get, basically. Uh, and this I should mention, this is for the case of Pareto potential. So put, uh, put tails that decay um, uh, polynomially, okay? They need to have a high uh, exponent, but um, as, as heavy as they come for the, for the model. Uh, there's been a lot more uh, developments afterwards. So there is this paper by uh, Peter Murtas, uh, Marcel Ortiz and Nadia, where they do aging and also um, scaling limits. This is also in the Pareto case. Oops. Sorry. There's a really nice sequence of, of, of papers as well, where the same statement, the same statement, uh, the first statement that I mentioned here, which people call complete localization in this model, uh, was proved for different classes of potential. So for what is, are called viable, viable class. So where the um, uh, upper tail decays like uh, the exponential to some power. So it could be stretched exponential, exponential itself or, or, or faster. And this was done progressively in, in a series of, of papers. So involving Hubert um, Lacan, Peter Murtas, Nadia Sidorova, Tvarovsky, Artyom Fyodorov later and Steven Wilhead. And I should also mention a paper that uh, we did with uh, Marek 
in, in Wolfgang, now in the, the double exponential case, where you cannot have this complete localization, but we, uh, we do have localization on one island. So this provides a type of answer to that uh, paper by, by Wolfgang and uh, Jürgen Gepp and Mo Chanov because they, they had this big set. The question is, okay, how many islands do I need? And the answer in the end, is you just need one, at least if you, if you are considering, if you're comparing the mass in probability, okay? So, okay, this concludes uh, my overview in ZD. I just want to mention that uh, there's, there's been a lot of study on, on ZD, but very little on other graphs. So as far as we are aware, there's almost nothing outside of this, of this case. Okay, there's, the, there's also the study of the, of the PAM in continuous space, but on discrete graphs, as far as we know, well, I was only able to find this paper by Fleischmann and Mochanov, they do the complete graph. And there's also a paper by Luca Avena, Onergun and Marion Hesse, which is a lot later in which they do the hypercube. But the types of questions here are also quite different from the, the ones that I've described to you are, are significantly uh, different. And well, okay, these are finite graphs, but they consider in a regime where the number of vertices is growing in a, in a way that is coupled with, uh, with time. Uh, very well. So finally, let me tell you what our results are. Uh, okay. So uh, basically our main result is uh, considers the, the graph is a infinite Galton Watson tree. Okay. So in a, in a super critical regime, so very super critical, we don't allow um, zero, we allow zero probability to, to die out, okay? So, uh, so this is parameterized by a distribution, um, which for us is a degree distribution, okay? So let me call D a random variable, which is supposed to represent the degrees of the vertices of our random tree. And I'm going to suppose that these degrees, they are uniformly bounded from below and from above. And I don't allow degree one because I want this to survive. Uh, with probability one. And I, more than that, I want the tree to really grow like a tree, to grow exponentially. So I'm going to ask that the average degree is strictly bigger than two, okay? So, okay, how do I define the tree in the usual way? I start with a fixed vertex as my root, and then uh, this is my generation zero. And if I have already generation n, how do I obtain the generation n plus one? each individual in generation N has uh, independent uh, offspring uh, with distribution is not D but B minus one because D is supposed to be my um, degree. Okay, so in this, uh, in this way, uh, well, actually, this, the, yeah, the difference is that my, maybe my origin should be should start with D, but this doesn't really this doesn't really change much. In this situation, if I look at a ball of radius r around the roots, and I look the, at the size of it, so what do I mean by that? I mean the uh, number of sites such that have the, the that they have distance. Uh, smaller or equal to r from the root. Uh, this is going to, um, this behaves exponentially, right? So this converges to a positive number, which I'm going to call maybe theta. And this is just the expected offspring, which is uh, bigger than zero by my uh, assumption. I'm hearing myself. I'm hearing myself somewhere. Somewhere. Maybe someone has the. Someone has the mic. Okay. So, as in the previous case, we consider a um, double exponential potential. Okay, 
there are some technicalities here that we try to avoid. I'm going to just skip this. This is not really very important. You can think of the potential exactly the DE class that I mentioned to you. So there is a parameter row that is still floating about that is going to appear in a moment. In a moment. So I consider the double, exponential, consider double potential, exponential potential. Um, oh, Renato. Uh, bounded degrees. Bounded degrees. Renato? Yes. So I think you're over time already. I'm over time, okay. I'm over. I didn't manage to give my results. Okay, so let me just state the result then. <laughs> uh, the result is basically an asymptotic statement for the almost sure asymptotic statement for the log of the total mass, okay? So the idea is that this would be, um, if you can say exactly what it is. Um, there's a first term that comes basically from the height of the potential in a certain p-dependent ball. There is a second term that has to do with a certain sprint that the random walk needs to do in order to reach a, the, a certain good region. And then there is a constant that comes from a variational problem and the rest is, um, is converging to zero, uh, okay? Um, all right, so I guess I better I better stop you. Sorry for being for being over time. Um, yeah, I was planning to tell you something about this constant, but uh, well, maybe another time. Thanks. Sorry for being over time. For being over time. Thank you, Renato. Um. Okay. Uh,